If you would turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 7, let me just review a little bit. Uh, at verse 23, the Lord gave this command, obey me and I will be your God and you will be my people. Walk in obedience to all I command you that it may go well with you. That's the NIV. And in uh, the New King James, it says, but this is what I commanded them saying, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you that it may be well with you, virtually the same thing. Um, we were talking last week a little bit about how do, you, how do you live in a world like this? How do you live in a, in a time like what Jeremiah is describing or what many of us feel is in our, in our own time? And the answer is to, you know, I, I think I said something about trusting the Lord and, and that kind of thing. But uh, over and over and over, Jeremiah puts it as obedience. Obedience to what the Lord commanded. Obedience, in effect, to the covenant that Israel, Judah, had made with the Lord. And uh, they need to obey what uh, the Lord has told them to do. And we can go back all the way to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and other parts of the Old Testament and find exactly what the Lord told them to do, how they were to act, how he was to be their one God. But they, they tended to, uh, to not do that. Look at what he goes on to say in verse 24, but they did not listen or pay attention. We've seen that over and over and over. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their own hearts. Again, that's the NIV. Uh, same thing. They followed the counsels and dictates of their evil hearts and went backward, not forward. Since, that, since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets. The Lord has sent prophets over and over and over from all the way back to virtually the beginning of the Old Testament. But especially during the times of the kings, the Lord sent prophet after prophet after prophet. Back in the 8th century, in the time of uh, Israel's fall and decline and destruction, the Lord had sent Isaiah and Micah and others to, to preach to his people. But uh, he sent, uh, I, and all these, uh, where was I? Uh, uh, Yet, verse 24, yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and dictates of their evil hearts and went backward, not forward. They did not listen to the prophets. He sent the prophets, and they did not listen. Again, verse 26, yet they did not obey me. You see the, the, the emphasis on obedience to the Lord, obedience to his commands, obedience to the covenant. Um. They did not obey me or incline their ears, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. In other words, things kept getting worse and worse. Each generation was getting worse than the previous generation, which is really to be expected when they begin, when the decline begins and the people will not listen to the voice of the Lord through the prophets, through the priests, let alone from the kings. There weren't any good kings in the northern kingdom. There were some in, in the southern kingdom, but uh, nevertheless, they got worse and worse. And uh, an encouraging word to Jeremiah in verse 27. Look at that. Look at that one. Therefore, you shall speak all these words to them. Now, what words are you talking about? He's talking about all the prophecies that Jeremiah, who has been called in their day to speak to them, one of that long line the prophets, he's been called to speak to them. And what is their response? Uh, you should speak all these words to them, but they will not obey you. You shall also call to them, but they will not answer you. Same response over and over and over. Now, we've seen that repeatedly already in, in Jeremiah. And you, if you look at the chapters to follow all the way through to the end, you see the same thing over and over and over, the refusal to obey the Lord. Particularly 
to obey the Lord and worship him as God alone. In other words, not turning to the other gods. That is the, the great sin that the people have committed, which we'll see again to, to them, uh, that he says to them. All right. Any question on that so far? We've, I know we talked about that some last week. At verse 28, uh, so you shall say to them, this is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord, voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction, same as we just read. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouths. Does this sound a little familiar? <laughs> We've got people saying today all over the place in lots of the universities and uh, schools everywhere that there is no absolute truth. There is no real truth. And uh, therefore, if there's no truth, there can't, if there isn't any truth, then there isn't anything to be true. And so truth has perished. Well, that's not exactly what Jeremiah was talking about. He was talking about disregarding the truth that they were hearing from the Lord, which of course is what we're doing as well, but it wasn't they were arguing there was no truth. They were just ignoring it and didn't care about it. Cut off your hair and cast it away and take up a lamentation on the desolate heights, for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. Woo. Uh, you know that cutting off your hair is a sign of great mourning and anguish. Uh, some places in the Old Testament, they talk about tearing their robes or tearing their clothes. That was also a sign of mourning, but cutting off your hair was a, a major thing, especially for the women. Uh, but to cut it off and cut off your beard, uh, that kind of thing, uh, it was all uh, the signs of uh, grief and just being cast away by the Lord. So uh, on the desolate heights, remember there was the heights where the trees were. They were worshiping the Baals and the other gods. Those heights will be desolate, that is empty, nothing there. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken this generation of his wrath. How would you, you know, the, we've got the the X generation, the millennial generation, the, this generation and that generation that we talk about, this is the generation of wrath that he's talking to here. This is the generation that is going to experience the greatest wrath of God imaginable. Their entire country, their entire way of life, their entire culture is going to be destroyed by the Lord generation of wrath. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. Now this is Judah, southern kingdom down there in the south. Israel is long gone, long been destroyed over a hundred years now. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to pollute it. What, uh, what is he talking about? What's the house called by his name? The temple. the temple. Yeah, of course, the temple. The city called by his name, the city of God, uh, the, the house of God is the temple, that big, magnificent temple that Solomon built that was on the, uh, the mount there where the pastor's been talking uh, about uh, Abraham taking Isaac for sacrifice and then didn't have to do it, but they... They uh, set up their abominations. That means they set up false gods in the temple itself. This is a little more than just obedience, obedient, disobedience, I should say. This is, this is not just simply turning your back upon God, but it's turning your back upon God, but turning your face toward other gods. Of course, that's what he's talking about. And the, the greatest insult that you could offer is to, to set up these gods, these foreign gods in the temple itself. The place that was built for the Lord and built by the Lord and built by the Lord's people. 
And uh, they did that and they polluted it. They made it unclean. When you read unclean in the scriptures, even in the New Testament, most of the time it's talking about ritual or religious uncleanness. And that, that has little to do or nothing to do perhaps with physical uncleanness, but it, ritual uncleanness, uncleanness toward God when you have uh, done things that are very displeasing to him. Touch things he's told you not to touch. Done things he's told you not to do. You have, uh, you have made yourself unclean spiritually. And that's what they have done. And they set up these gods and they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the Valley of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. Child sacrifice. Tophet, Hinnom, is a valley just outside on the southern side of Jerusalem. And it was uh, notorious for most of his uh, Jerusalem's history. It was like a dump. A place where all the trash went, all the garbage went. They buried the unrighteous dead there. They buried the car or they put the carcass of animals there. It was constantly on fire. They did the trash being burned. Now, Jerusalem at this time was a pretty good sized city. So there would have been a lot of trash out there in, in, the, in that valley. And that's where they set up this God, these gods that required human sacrifice, and they burned their children, their sons and daughters in the fire. And it, the Lord says, which I did not command, or nor did it come into my heart. That isn't to say that God didn't know that it was a possibility. The nations all around Israel had been doing that for generations, especially the, the Canaanites, the Moabites, the uh, Edomites, those peoples had been offering human sacrifice for a long time, and especially children. So you want to know how far down they've gone? They have not only turned to other gods, but they've gone to worshiping those other gods in ways that are just completely, completely, completely an abomination to the Lord. Can you think of any way we offer, we offer our children in sacrifice? Yeah. Abortion. Yeah, really. I mean, they're, we're, they're, they were amateurs compared to us. Yeah. And what are we offering them to? They're not, they're not even acknowledging that. That's, that's when they have an abortion. They thought that the way they deal with it is to feed us. It's not real, you know. Yeah. They just, they don't acknowledge that it's a life. So. Yeah, I, I find it funny, not funny, strange that that you can see that one commercial on TV by a company that will advertise, well, that before your baby was born and when your baby was in the womb, they will talk like that. And then the very, very next thing we're talking about, oh no, it's not really a person. It's a, it's a, just, just a clump of cells. Yeah. And the, the uh, Department of Justice is now suing Texas over its new abortion law saying that uh, abortion is a constitutional right. You ever read the Constitution? Hard to find abortion mentioned in the Constitution because nobody was aborting in those days. Uh, but what, who are we sacrificing these children to? Why are we aborting so many children? Self-convenience. Parsley, self-convenience, other ways of putting it? Money. Money. Yes. Convenience. You don't want to be inconvenienced by having children that you don't want. Uh, yeah. uh, not having to raise children that are going to cost you a lot of money, etc. There's all kinds of reasons that people do abortions. I mean, they're you know, and, uh, mostly it's just for the convenience. Most abortions are done for the convenience of the family, the mother in particular. They're not, they're not done because they needed to be done because of a, a medical problem. Very, very rare is that. So we're just offering it to, to the gods that we worship, whatever god that happens to be. The god of self, the god of mammon, whoever. And something like 2 million abortions a year in the United States. And they're trying to increase it and make it more abundant and free. 
Yeah. So while this is offensive, as we read this, I mean, we, we're talking about taking a born child, a, a, a little kid, a little child, and burning it in honor of these gods. The basic moral issue is really not any different of sacrificing the unborn that are, as far as the Lord is concerned, persons in the womb. The Bible says that over and over and over. Okay, so the Lord didn't command that and he never even considered commanding that. It was never even in his heart. You know, when I was in the eighth grade, I went to school out in California. One of the things that we had to do, we took a test on the Constitution of the United States of America. And it was a complete, it took all day to take that test. It was a complete Constitution. And we had to know it because we couldn't go on to high school without it. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that anymore. No, it's not a convention. Mm -hmm. I've, also, I've often wondered. How, how they can, with a clear conscience, say they see these things in the Constitution that are plainly not there. Well, and then I, my wife had a portion between my oldest boy and the youngest. There's nine years between them. Mm -hmm. But the doctor come and told me that she would probably die. And I said, well, well, to me, that's a different thing when the doctor has to make a choice between which life he's going to save. Well, I wasn't going to try to raise them boys by myself. Well, did that doctor tell, tell you also that everybody is destined to die eventually? Well, that's true. This was. There, a tubular pregnancy. Well, it wouldn't have survived anyway. An ectopic pregnancy can't, it isn't viable. Well, there are those, and there are there are times when for real, genuine, honest medical reasons, it may be necessary. But 98% of the abortions done in the United States are not done for that reason. They are not done for medically necessary reasons. They're done for, uh, what do they call it, uh, stress and duress on the mother, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they, they, they are done for the convenience of the mother and the, perhaps the family. But I think we're, we're sacrificing our children to other things besides just, just an abortion. We're, we're allowing things to be taught to them. Um, that are not true, uh, that there, there are more than two genders or yes. you know, I could have made a mistake in the gender that you are. So you, you can decide for yourself what you want to be. I, I think that's a form of sacrificing your children and for yes, society in, in large to support that. Those would be, I think, we would call those more of a spiritual sacrifice um, rather than the actual blood sacrifice that we're talking about here. Well, they let them live so long. Almost born. Yeah, well, I, I don't really want to discuss abortion anymore. I just wanted us to see that if we're offended at what's going on here in Jeremiah, we should really be offended at what's going on here in the United States. Really. Uh, all right, so what is the Lord going to do about it? Therefore, verse 32, the days are coming. Those days out there, it's coming, says the Lord, when it will be no more called Tophet or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. Remember, it's a cemetery area as well, especially for uh, those that were unclean. The corpses of this people will be food for the birds of the heaven and for the beasts of the field uh, of the earth. And no one will frighten them away. Then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride for the land shall be desolate. 
So he's talking about a time that's coming and it will come under the Babylonians. And it's not far off at this point when there will be total and absolute destructions. They will bury people till there's no place to bury them anymore. And this particular valley out here where they, they can't bury people, they would just be taken out there and dumped basically. And uh, it's going to be a horrible, horrible time. He's talking about the there'd be no joy in the city, none. Uh, the voice of, of uh, all of those will be gone. All of the, he was talking about uh, the voice of mirth and gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of, there'd be no marriage at that time because, well, lots of the people are gonna be killed, but it just won't be a time when you can get married. You're gonna be, the exile is going to take place. People are gonna be hauled off to exile. There'll be no gladness in the city of Jerusalem when this event occurs. And it's coming. It's coming. I know this is, uh, this is discouraging, <laughs> but the Lord doesn't put up with stuff forever. At some point, the ax falls. And uh, there were a lot of there were a lot of loyal people. There was a, bit, a big remnant. We're going to talk about that in chapter 23. There was a remnant of the people that were faithful to God and loved God and obeyed God as best they could under the circumstances. But by and large, the, the nation, the city, the temple are all going to face destruction for their wickedness and their evil and their turning against the Lord. And all of the immorality that follows turning away from God. And I think that's the place where we can see the parallels in so many things. What Tara was just talking about, the, the whole issue of sexuality and uh, transgenderism and uh, one sex becoming the other or trying to and the destruction that that entails in the lives of people and uh, so on. Uh, it's terrible. In verse chapter eight, a few verses there that continue the same thought. This is a continuation that the vision really isn't, isn't at that point. At that time, says the Lord, that same time he was talking about, the days are coming just above. They shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. Who's going to do that? Who's going to bring all these, dig up all these graves and dig up all these bones? Yeah. Well, have, these people who are so wicked are going to go even that step farther in their deprivation. Yes. This isn't talking about the resurrection. No. <laughs> this, is, this is talking about wicked and evil people like the Babylonians who want to desecrate the entire city and make it uninhabitable and a place that cannot be worshipped. Because to take the dead bones out of the grave and spread them all over, as it said, as it says in verse 7, uh, 2, I mean, they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven which they have loved and which they have served and after which they have walked, which they have sought and which they have worshiped. All these piled up phrases to say, all of these bones of the, the, the kings and the priests and the prophets and the people of the land that uh, disobeyed God, their bones are gonna be taken out of the grave, spread out all over the place, spread in front of the sun, the moon, the stars. These objects that they worshiped, Okay. They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be refuse on the face of the earth. Then death shall be the chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord. People are going to prefer death to life at this point. It's going to get so bad that they're going to all wish they were dead, even those that aren't, of course. Um, there wasn't a worse fate imaginable 
for a Jewish person than to think of when he died, his bones or his body will just be left to rot in the open and his bones just scattered over the land like that with no honor given to, to that person in burial. This is one of the worst things that could be imagined by a Jewish person. It was just the, the last and the greatest insult imaginable. And the Babylonians were going to, in effect, do this very thing to the people of God. Why? Because they turned away from it. And they're going to wish they were dead rather than be alive. So that's the situation. Now, it's, it's, it's difficult to be very much encouraged by a passage like this chapter seven. It's difficult to find something that's, uh, that's real positive, but there are some things that we can say about it. And the chief one of them is, uh, you know, go, it's not go and do likewise. The prophets have been telling them not to do what they've been doing, but to go and do otherwise, to go and, and obey the Lord and to follow the Lord so that this fate will not befall you. That's what, that's what this is really all about. That's why Jeremiah is preaching this to the people so that they'll hear and they'll turn away from, while there's still an opportunity to turn away from the evil that is coming. It's coming. But it may not be so personal if you turn away from it yourself. It can be part of, part of the remnant. Any questions or comments you'd like to make? I know this is not a pleasant thing. I know it, but it's there. And this, this is the last one of these I'm going to deal with in some detail. Like this. Can we relate it to, to what God gives us in, about revelation, about what's coming to us? We can relate. Um, not the same way, but isn't that an encouragement to us to know? Yes, that? yes. Revelation is talking about the last, last, last days the days before the return of the Lord, the days of the tribulation, the days of the millennium, and so on. That's what Revelation is talking about. Because the world really hasn't changed. And zillions of people have turned their backs upon the Lord. And Revelation was written to the churches in the first century in order to, to alert them to the danger that, that the world was in and what, was, what ultimately was going to happen and to turn to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings prior to that. Remember those, those seven letters to the seven churches? There's severe warnings in those letters that then are just uh, compounded in the warnings that come in, uh, in uh, chapter six, seven, eight, and all the way through 19. And uh, yes, so... It's a, it's a warning. These things just continue to, to be warnings of people to turn away from God and they're going to face the wrath of God. Yes? One of the things I've seen in this in the last few weeks that's an encouragement to me is the long-suffering patience of God. Granted, each time he's warned them, it's gotten worse, and the judgment expounded by him has gotten worse. Yet he could have just snapped his finger and ended it all, but he continued to lovingly warn them. That long-suffering love is mm -hmm. so hard to understand. Yes, there is tremendous patience on God's part. This didn't just happen overnight in Israel either. This has been going on for hundreds of years. They had the warning of the Northern Kingdom, which Jeremiah has mentioned numerous times. They were warned. The Northern Kingdom was warned by Isaiah and Amos and Micah and other prophets of the eighth century. They were warned. The city of Nineveh was warned by Jonah. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And that's why Jonah didn't want to go there. He, he knew God was a long-suffering and patient God, and he didn't want 
He didn't want Assyrians to repent. He wanted them to be destroyed because of their vicious and awful behavior against the other nations. And that's one of the big lessons of the book of Jonah, that God loves even the worst of sinners that repent. <clears throat> okay? So, it's a, it's a time that wrath is coming. Now, uh, if you will turn to the, the next section that I, I gave you the handout for this morning, uh, chapter 23. We're going to skip from chapter 8 to chapter 23. Chapter 23 has to do mostly with false prophets. And I chose to do this chapter because we need to understand the role and function of the leadership, particularly the spiritual leadership in the destruction of the nation. From chapter 20 up to chapter 23, verse 8, Jeremiah is primarily talking about the leaders, the political leaders of the nation, the kings who were bad kings, who were not following the way of the Lord, who were allowing to go on what was going on, who participated and aided and abetted what was happening in the nation. All the way from chapter 20 to chapter 23, verse 8. So I want to read these first eight verses because in this passage, the, the role of the kings is just summarized in, in two verses. And then we see some, some real and genuine hope. Verse Chapter 21, verse 23, woe to the shepherds. And who are the shepherds? Uh, no. Look at verse uh, two there toward the end. Behold, I will tend to you for the evil of your doings. No, <laughs> the shepherds are the kings. They're the great shepherds, like David is a shepherd over his people, and God, and the Lord is the shepherd over his people. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. There, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God, the Lord God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people. You've scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. Uh, it's real clear if you follow the context here from chapter 22. He's talking about the kings. The over and over he refers to the kings as the shepherds. They were the main people who were leading the people and supposed to be leading them in the way, the ways of God. Remember that uh, Samuel did not appreciate the fact that Israel and our Judah and Israel in his time wanted to have kings instead of judges, you remember? And he warned them what kings would do. And what did the kings do? They did the very things uh, That, uh, that the Lord warned them. You scattered my flock. They were supposed to gather the flock. They were supposed to take care of the flock. They were supposed to take care of the sheep. It's, a, it's an analogy, uh, a metaphor for, the, uh, for the, what the kings were supposed to do. They were supposed to take care of the flock, supposed to take care of the sheep, but rather they destroyed them and scattered them driven them away. You've not attended to them, he says in verse 1. Not done what you were supposed to do. Good kings like Josiah attempted to, Hezekiah, David, there were some that were good that attempted to be good kings, but uh, most of the kings uh, had, had the opposite effect. All right. So this is a summary of the previous uh, three chapters, 20, 21, 22. 
these two verses are a summary. This is what's going to happen with these shepherds who have turned the people away from the Lord. He says in verse three, but, but, watch those buts in the, uh, in the Bible. There's something different, something, there's a huge contrast coming. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil, the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. What is he talking about there from your understanding of biblical history? Yes, that's worth leading, but he's talking about shepherds, plural. I will set up shepherds over them. There's a number of kings. Uh, you'll see that, that this has to be referring to the kings here in, in a minute or two. Uh, but uh, the kings, evil kings mostly, have scattered the people. They have destroyed the people by not following the ways of the Lord. How do you think that the kings did this? What do kings do? They, they, they set an example. And what kind of example were these kings setting? And what were their main concerns? Land, power, money, reputation. They weren't stopping what was going on in the temple. They weren't doing anything about the false prophecies that were being taught. They weren't doing anything about the priesthood, doing all these evil things in the temple itself. They could have stopped that if they had chosen to do so, but they didn't. They were as responsible. They were at the top. They were like the president of the United States or a premier of another country. They, they were the ones that should have led the people right, been the examples of righteousness, but they weren't. And so the Lord is going to gather the remnant out of all the countries where he sent them. Where, where's that? Who's he talk, what's he talking about there? Where'd they go? Yeah, they went to exile. The nation was destroyed. Israel had been destroyed by the Assyrians. The, the northern king, Israel, had been destroyed by the Assyrians and taken off into exile all over the Assyrian Empire and basically just disappeared. And guess whose turn it is now? It's Judah's turn for the very kind of same kind of thing, even worse. Even worse, as we will see. But they turned against the Lord, and now the Lord is about to send them into exile. But he's promising that that's not the end. And this is where I think we can really find some encouragement. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, bring them back to the land that, that he promised them. And he did do that. Bill? Uh, both in North and the Southern? It appears that, yes, that there is a number or a certain element of the Northern Kingdom that was not lost that would be brought back to. We'll see that in, in subsequent verses where he talks about Judah, Israel, and Judah the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. To a large extent, the northern kingdom had just disappeared and, and amalgamated with other nations and just lost. In Babylon, there was much more of a godly group of people there that's continued to, to be faithful to the Lord and to be attempt to be good Jewish people, even in Babylon. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel was in Babylon for part of the time. Daniel was there. And there were, you know, we, we read some of the later Old Testament and we see the people of God were, numerous of them were attempting, the remnant were attempting to be faithful even in Babylon. But the Lord is going to send them there, but he's promising that's not the end. 
He's going to bring a remnant back from all those nations. Okay? And I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Okay, so he's talking about shepherds. And now we're getting into what Jenny was talking about here in verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Now, what's he talking about here? It, it went from one king, uh, from kings, from shepherds, to a single king. This is a messianic prophecy. This is one of the great prophecies of the coming of Messiah in, in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, raised to David from the house of David, from, from David's family, a branch, which is a symbol all through the scriptures, of a king, a branch of righteousness. The kings have been notoriously unrighteous. But this king is going to be righteous, and he's going to reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will dwell Safely, Bill. That's what I was saying. It's coming right here where there's a remnant. How many? We, there's no way to know. But a remnant of Judah and Babylon will come and whatever is left of the northern kingdom will come back and they will dwell safely in the land. Now, this is the name by which he will be called. What? The Lord, our righteousness. You know a name that means something similar to that in the Old Testament? Not a trick question, but there, the name Zedekiah means the Yah on the end stands for Yahweh, the Lord. Zedekiah means my righteousness. The Lord is my righteousness. So this name is almost the same as that. It's our righteousness instead of my righteousness, but it's almost the same. This is one of the names for the Messiah. If you look at the banners in the worship, in the auditorium, you'll see one of them, that Jesus is our righteousness. This is referring to the coming of the Messiah. When that last and final king is going to come, and reign and bring righteousness. Okay. I hope that's a little more positive uh, there on the end today. <laughs> the Lord is going to bring a righteous king, replace all those evil shepherds and all those evil shepherds did in the past. God bless all of you. Thank you. How many years? 75 today. Happy birthday. Any more?